So I've been doing this for about two years, more than 100 of these gigs. Uh, this is about the last one. One more, and it's over for me. And I figured I wanted to write a song to end it, right? But then I realized I don't sing and I can't write music. But I came up with the refrain, at least, right? And this captures the point. If you understand this refrain, you're going to understand everything I want to say to you today. It has four parts first. Creativity and innovation always builds on the past. The past always tries to control the creativity that builds upon it. Free societies enable the future by limiting this power of the past, and ours is less and less a free society. 1774, free culture was born. In a case called Donaldson v. Beckett in the House of Lords in England, free culture was made because copyright was stopped. In 1710, the Statute of Anne had said that copyright should be for a limited term, just 14 years. But in the 1740s, when Scottish publishers started reprinting classics, you've got to love the Scots, the London publishers said, stop. They said, copyright is forever. Sonny Bono said copyright should be forever minus a day, but the London publishers said copyright is forever. These publishers, people who Milton referred to as old patentees and monopolizers in the trade of book selling, men who do not labor in an honest profession except him here, to <laughs> learning is indebted, these publishers demanded a common law copyright that would be forever. In 1769, in a case called Miller v. Taylor, they won their claim. But just five years later, in Donaldson, Miller was reversed. And for the first time in history, the works of Shakespeare were freed. Freed from the control of a monopoly publishers. Freed culture was the result of that case. Remember the refrain. I would sing it, but you wouldn't want me to. OK. <clears throat> well, by the end, we'll see. Um, that free culture was carried to America. That was our birth, 1790. We established a regime that left creativity unregulated. Now, it was unregulated because copyright law only covered, quote, printing. Copyright law did not control derivative work. And copyright law granted this protection for the limited time of 14 years. That was our birth. And more fundamentally, in 1790, because of the technology of the time, all things protected were free code. You could take the works of Shakespeare and read the source. The source was the book. You could take the work of any creativity protected by the law and understand what made it tick studying it. This was the design and the regime. And even in the context of patents, there were transparent technologies. You didn't, take, you didn't need to take the cotton gin and read the patent to understand how it worked, right? You could just take it apart. These were legal protections in a context where understanding and learning was still set free. Control in this culture was tiny. That was cute, right? Control tiny, OK. And not just then. Right? Forget the 18th century, the 19th century. Even at the birth of the 28th, 20th century, here's my favorite example here. 1928, my hero, Walt Disney created this extraordinary work, <laughs> The Birth of Mickey Mouse in the form of Steamboat Willie. But what you probably don't recognize about Steamboat Willie and his emergence into Mickey Mouse is that in 1928, Walt Disney, quote, to use the language of the Disney Corporation today, stole Willie from Buster Keaton's Steamboat Bill. It was a parody, a takeoff. It was a building upon Steamboat Bill. Steamboat Bill was produced in 1928, no 14 years. Just take it, rip, mix, and burn, as he 
did <laughs> to produce the Disney Empire. This was his character. Walt always parroted feature-length mainstream films to produce the Disney Empire, and we see the product of this. This is the Disney Corporation taking works in the public domain and not even in the public domain and turning it into vastly greater new creativity. They took the works of this guy, these guys, the Brothers Grimm, who you think are probably great authors on their own. They produce these horrible stories, these fairy tales, which anybody should keep their children far from because they're utterly, utterly bloody and moralistic stories which are not the sort of thing that children should see, but they were retold for us by the Disney Corporation. Now, the Disney Corporation could do this because that culture lived in a commons, an intellectual commons, a cultural commons where people could freely take and build. It was a lawyer-free zone. <laughs> it was culture which you didn't need the permission of someone else to take and build upon. That was the character of creativity at the birth of the last century. It was built on a constitutional requirement that protection be for limited times, and it was originally limited. 14 years if the author lived, 28. Then in 1831, it went to 42. Then in 1909, it went to 56. And then, magically, starting in 1962, look, no hands, the term <laughs> expands. Eleven times in the last 40 years, it has been extended for existing works, not just for new works that are going to be created, but existing works. The most recent is the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. Those of us who love it know it as the Mickey Mouse Protection Act, which, of course, every time Mickey's about to pass in the public domain, copyright terms are extended. And the meaning of this pattern is absolutely clear to those who pay to produce it. The meaning is, no one can do to the Disney Corporation what Walt Disney did to the Brothers Grimm. That though we had a culture where people could take and build upon what went before, that's over. There is no such thing as the public domain in the minds of those who have produced these 11 extensions in the last 40 years because now culture is owned. Okay, sorry. Remember the refrain. We always build on the past. The past always tries to stop us. Freedom is about stopping the past, but we have lost that ideal. Things are different now from even when Walt produced the Walt Disney Corporation. In this year now, we have a massive system to regulate creativity, a massive system of lawyers regulating creativity as copyright law has expanded in unrecognizable forms going from a regulation of publishing now to a regulation of copying, you know, the things that computers do when you boot them up, going from copies to not just a, uh, copies of the original work, but even derivative works on top of it, going from 14 years to for new works produced by a real author, there are fewer and fewer of those people out there, life plus 70 years. That's the expansion of law, but also there's been an expansion of control through technology. Right? First of all, this reality of opaque creativity, you know that as proprietary code. Creativity where you don't get to see how the thing works, and the law protects the thing you can't see. It's not Shakespeare that you can study and understand because the code is by nature open. Nature has been reformed in our modern technology, technological era, so nature can be hidden, and the law still protects it. And not just through the protection, but through increasing control of uses of creative work. Here's my Adobe eBook reader, right? Some of you have seen this before, I'm sure. Here's uh, Middlemarch. This is a work in the public domain. Here's the, quote, permissions. The lawyer had something to do with this. That you can do with this work in the public domain, right? You're allowed to copy 10 selections into the clipboard every 10 days. Like, who got these numbers? I don't know. But... Um, you can print 10 pages of this 4 million page book every 10 days, and you're allowed, feel free, to use the read aloud button to listen to this book, right? Now, Aristotle's Politics, another book, you know, in the public domain, never really protected by copyright. 
But with this book, you can't copy any text into the selection. You can't print any pages. But feel free, you can listen to this book aloud. And then, to my great embarrassment, here's my latest book, right? No copying, no printing, and don't you dare use the technology to read my book aloud. <laughs> now, I have a sing button in the next version of the Adobe <laughs> ebook later, but the point is that control is built into the technology. Book sellers in 1760 had no conception of the power that you coders would give them someday in the future, and that control adds to this expansion of law. Law and technology produces together a kind of regulation of creativity we've not seen before. Right? right? Because here, here's a simple copyright lesson. Law regulates copy. What's that mean? Well, before the internet, think of this as the world of all possible uses of a copyrighted work. Most of them are unregulated. Top talking about fair use. This is not fair use. This is unregulated uses. To read it. It's not a fair use, it's an unregulated use. To give it to someone is not a fair use, it's unregulated. To sell it, to sleep on top of it, right? To do any of these things with this text is unregulated. Now, in the center of this unregulated use, there's a small bit of stuff regulated by the copyright law. For example, publishing the book, that's regulated. And then, within this small range of things regulated by copyright law, there's this tiny band before the internet of stuff we call fair use. Uses that otherwise would be regulated, but that the law says you can engage in without the permission of anybody else. So, for example, quoting a text in another text, that's a copy, but it's still a fair use. That means the world was divided into three camps, not two. Unregulated uses. Regulated uses that were fair use and the quintessential copyright world. Three categories. Enter the internet. Every act is a copy, which means all of these unregulated uses disappear. Presumptively, everything you do on your machine, on the network, is a regulated use. And now it forces us into this tiny little category of arguing about, oh, what about the fair uses? What about the fair uses? Fair... I would say the word, I'm not. To hell with the fair uses. What about the unregulated uses we had of culture before this massive expansion of control? Now, unregulated uses disappear. We argue about fair uses, and they find a way to remove fair use, right? Here's a familiar creature to many of you, right? The wonderful Sony Ibo pet which you can teach to do all sorts of things. Somebody set up a wonderful set, ibopet.com site, to teach people how to hack their dog. Now remember, <laughs> their dog, right? And this site actually wanted to help you hack your dog to teach your dog to dance jazz. And remember, you know, Europeans are sometimes confused about this, but it's not a crime to dance jazz in the United States, right? <laughs> This is a completely permissible activity, even for a dog to dance jazz. Georgia, there's a couple jurisdictions I'm not sure about, but <laughs> mainly dancing jazz is an OK activity. So Ibo Pet said, here, here's how to hack your dog to make it dance jazz. If anything, it would be a fair use of this piece of plastic that costs, costs over $1,500. You would think this is a fair use. Letter to the site. Your site contains information providing the means to circumvent IBO, wears copy protection protocol constituting a violation of the anti-circumvention provisions of the DMCA, even though the use is fair use. The use is not permitted under the law. Fair use erased by this combination of technological control and laws that say don't touch it, leaving one thing left in this field that had three control. Copyright, controlling creativity. Now, never, here's the thing, you've got to remember, you've got to see this. This is the point, and the world of Jack Valenti misses this. Here's the point, never has it been more controlled, ever. Take the addition, the changes to copyright's term, take the changes to copyright scope, put it against the background of an extraordinarily concentrated uh, uh, structure of media, and you produce the fact that never in our history have fewer people controlled more of the evolution of our culture, never. Not even before the birth of free culture. 
not in 1773 when copyrights were perpetual because, again, they only controlled printing. How many people had printers? You could do what you wanted with these works. Ordinary uses were completely unregulated. But today, your life is perpetually regulated in the world that you live in. It is controlled by the law. Here is the refrain. Creativity depends on stopping that control. They will always try to impose it. We are free to the extent we resist it, but we are increasingly not free. You, or the GNU, you can pick, build a world of transparent creativity. That's your job. This weird exception in the 21st century of an industry devoted to transparent creativity, free sharing of knowledge. It was not a choice in 1790. It was nature in 1790. You are rebuilding nature. This is what you do. You build a common base that other people can build upon. You make money, off, well, not enough, but some of you make money off of this. This is your enterprise. You gate like it's 1790. That's your way of being. And you remind the rest of the world of what it was like when creativity and innovation was a process where people added to common knowledge in this battle between a proprietary structure and a free structure, you show the value of the free. And as announcements uh, uh, such as Real Network's announcement demonstrate, the free still captures the imagination of the most creative in this industry. But just for now. Just for now. Because just for now, free code threatens. And the threats turn against free code. Let's talk about software patents. There was a guy, Mr. Gates, who's brilliant, right? He's brilliant. He's a brilliant businessman. He has some insights. He's even a brilliant policymaker. Here's what he wrote about software patents. If people had understood how patents would be granted when most of today's ideas were invented and had taken out patents, the industry would be at a complete standstill today. Here's the first thing I'm sure you've read of Bill Gates, which you all 100% agree with. Gates is right, absolutely right. Then we shift into the genius businessman. The solution is patenting as much as we can. A future startup with no patents of its own will be forced to pay whatever price the giants choose to impose. That price might be high. Established companies have an interest in excluding future competitors. Excluding future competitors. Now, it's been four years since this battle came on your radar screen in a way that people were upset about. Four years, and there has been tiny changes in this space. Of course, there's a bunch of Tim changes, right? Tim went out there and he set up something to attack um, uh, bad patents. That was fine. There was a bunch of Q. Todd Dickinson changes. He was the former head of the Patent Commission, never saw a patent he didn't like, but he, you know, he said some things to make some minor changes in how this process should work. But the field has been dominated by apologists for the status quo. Apologists who say, oh, we've always patented everything, therefore we should continue to patent this. People like Greg Aronian, who goes around and says, see, every single patent out there is idiotic, but turns out the patent system's wonderful and we should never reform it at all. Right? This is the world we live in now that produces this continued growth of software patents. And here's the question, what have you done about it? What have you done about it? Excluding future competitors, that's the slogan, right? And that company that gave birth to the slogan that I just cited has only ever used patents in a defensive way, but as Dan Gilmore has quoted, they've also said, look, the open source movement out there has got to realize that there are a lot of patents at stake. And don't imagine we won't use them when we must. Now, the thing about patents is they're not nuclear weapons, right? It's not physics that makes them powerful. It's lawyers and lawmakers and Congress. And the thing is, 
you can fight all you want against the physics that makes a nuclear weapon destroy all of mankind, but you can succeed not at all. Yet you could do something about this. You could fuel a revolution that fights these legal threats to you, but what have you done about it? What have you done about it? Second, the copyright wars. Right? There's a certain sense in which these are the Homeric tragedies. Right? And I mean this in a very modern sense. Here's a story. So there was a documentary filmmaker who's making a documentary film about education in America. And he's shooting across his classroom with lots of people, completely dis- well, kids, completely distracted, a television in the back of the classroom. When they get back to the editing room, they realize that on the television, you can barely make out the show for two seconds. It's The Simpsons, Homer Simpson, on the screen. So they call up Matt Groening, who was a friend of the documentary film. They said, you know, is this going to be a problem? It's just a couple seconds. Matt says, no, 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 no problem. Call so-and-so. So they called so-and-so. So-and-so said, call so-and-so. Eventually, you know, so-and-sos always end up to be lawyers. So eventually they got to the lawyer and they said, you know, is this going to be a problem? It's a documentary film. It's about education. Just a couple seconds. The so-and-so said, 25,000 bucks. He said, 25,000 bucks? It's a couple seconds. What do you mean, 25,000 bucks? The so-and-so said, I don't give a goddamn what it is for 25,000 bucks or change your movie. Now you look at this and you say, this is insane. It's insane. And if it's only Hollywood that has to deal with this, okay, that's fine. Let them be insane. The problem is their insane rules are now being applied to the whole world. This insanity of control is expanding as everything you do touches copyright. So the broadcast flag which says, before a technology is allowed to touch DTV, it must be architected to control DTV through watching for the broadcast flag. Rebuild the network to make sure this bit of contact is perfectly protected. Or the mandated Fritz Hollings chips that will be imposed on machines through uh, the law, which... uh, which Intel referred to as the police state in every computer quite accurately, Um, and they would build these computers but are opposed to this police state system. And then, most recently, this outrageous proposal that Congress ratify the right of the copyright owners to launch attacks on P2P machines. Malicious code that goes out there and tries to bring down P2P machines. Digital vigilantism. And not only does, you know, you're allowed to sue if they do it and they shouldn't have done it, but you have to go to the attorney general and get permission from the attorney general before you're allowed to sue about code that goes out there and destroys your machine when it shouldn't be allowed to have destroyed your machine. This is what they talk about in Washington. This is what they're doing. And, and, you know, the question is, this is their, as Jack Valenti says, terrorist war they're fighting against you and your children, the terrorists, right? Now you step back and you say, For what? Why? What's the problem here? And they say, it's to stop the harm which you are doing. So what is that harm? What is the harm which is being done by these terrible peer-to-peer networks out there? Take their own numbers. They said last year five times the number of CDs sold were traded on the net for free, five times. Then take their numbers about the harm caused by five times the number sold being traded for free. A drop in sales of 5%. 5%. Now, there was a recession last year, and they raised their prices, and they changed the way they counted. All of those might actually account for the 5%. But even if they didn't, the total harm caused by five times being traded for free was 5%. Now, you know, I'm all for war in the right context, but is this the grounds one stands on to call for a, quote, terrorist war against technology? This harm, even if 5%, gives them the right to destroy this industry? I mean, does anybody think about the decline in this industry, which is many times as large as theirs, caused by this terrorist war being launched against anybody who touches new content? Ask a venture capitalist how much money he's willing to invest in new technologies that would touch content in a way that Hillary Rosen or Jack Valenti don't sign off of. The answer is a simple one, zero. Zero. They've shut down an industry and innovation 
in the name of this terrorist war, and this is the cause, this is the harm. 5%. And what have you done about it? It's insane. It's extreme. It's controlled by political interests. It has no justification in the traditional values that justify legal regulation, and we've done nothing about it. We're bigger than they are. We've got rights on our side. And we've done nothing about it. We've let them control this debate. Here's the frame that leads to this. They win because we've done nothing to stop it. There's our congressman, J.C. Watts. J.C. Watts is uh, the only black member of the Republican Party in leadership. He's going to resign from Congress. He's been there seven and a half years. He's had enough. Nobody can believe it. Nobody in Washington can believe it. What? Not spend 700 years in Washington? He says, uh, you know, I like you guys, but seven years is enough. Eight years is too much. I'm out of here. Just about the time J.C. Watts came to Washington, this war on free code and free culture began. Just about that time. In an interview uh, two days ago, Watts said, here's the problem with Washington. If you're explaining, you're losing. If you're explaining, you're losing. It's a bumper sticker culture. People have to get it like that, and if they don't, if it takes three seconds to make them understand, you're off their radar screen. Three seconds to understand, you lose. This is our problem. Six years after this battle began, we're still explaining. We're still explaining, and we are losing. They frame this as a massive battle to stop theft, to protect property. They don't get why re-architecting the network destroys innovation and creativity. They extend copyrights perpetually. They don't get how that itself is a form of theft, a theft of our common culture. We have failed in getting them to see what the issues here are, and that's why we live in this place where a tradition speaks of freedom and their controls take it away. Now, I've spent two years talking to you, to us, about this, and uh, we've not done anything yet. A lot of energy building, Sites and blogs and slash dot stories. Nothing yet to change that vision in Washington. Because we hate Washington, right? Who would waste his time on Washington? But if you don't do something now, this freedom you built, that you spend your life coding, this freedom will be taken away either by those who see you as a threat who then invoke the system of law we call patents, or those who take advantage of the extraordinary expansion of control that the law of copyright now gives them over innovation, either of these two changes through law will produce a world where your freedom has been taken away. And if you can't fight for your freedom, you don't deserve it. But you've done nothing. There's a handful. We can name them. The people you could be supporting, you could be taking. Like just, you know, here, just take, just put this in perspective. <clears throat> How many people have given to EFF? Okay. How many people have given to EFF more money than they give to their local telecom to give them shitty DSL service? See? Four. How many people have given more money to EFF than they give each year to support Name the monopoly that they're supporting to support the other side. Right? How many people have given anything to these people? Right? Voucher, Canon, you know, not, this is not a left and right issue, right? Here's the most important thing to recognize. This is not about conservatives versus liberals. In our case in Eldred, we have this brief filed by 17 economists, including Milton Friedman, James Buchanan, Ronald Coase, Ken Arrow, you know, lunatics. 
right, left-wing liberals, right? Friedman said he'd only join it if the word no-brainer existed in the brief somewhere. And this was a complete no-brainer for him. This is not about left and right. This is about right and wrong. That's what this battle is. These people are from the left and right. Hank Parrott, I think the grandfather of cyberspace, the law of cyberspace running in Illinois, is struggling to get support to take this message to Washington. These are the sources, the places to go. Then there's this organization. Now, some of you say, are, I'm on the board of this organization. I fight many battles on that board. Some of you say, we're too extreme. You say that in the wrong way, right? You send emails and say, you're too extreme. You ought to be more mainstream. You know, and I'm with you. I think EFS is great. It's been the symbol. It's fought the battles. But, you know, it's fought the battles in ways that sometimes need to be reformed. Help us. Don't help us by whining. Help us by writing on the check you send in. Please be more Mainstream, right? The check, right? This is the mentality you need to begin to adopt to change this battle because if you don't do something now, then in another two years, somebody else will say, okay, two years is enough. I've got to go back to my life. <clears throat> They'll say again to you, nothing's changed except your freedom, which has increasingly been taken away by those who recognize that the future is against them, and they have the power in D.C. to protect themselves against that future. Free society to be damned. Thank you very much.